Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence. Let's give God praise in this place. Hallelujah. He's worthy this morning. freedom in this place this morning. Come on. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.
not easily perceived is when praise, the thought came, there's nothing wrong with, there's nothing ever wrong with praising. There, you're never going to go wrong with praise in your mouth because there's an alignment that can come in your life to your mind, to your heart, to your emotions, that as we praise him, as we lift him up, and that's what we've been declaring this morning, that he's our breath in our lungs, that as he gives us the air to breathe, the air to go on, the air, that wisdom can come to us as we, as we praise him. Sometimes Psalm 139 talks about where can I go from your spirit? And, and, and the psalmist lists a lot of different places, but the bottom line is you can't get away from it. And so when we come in here, even corporately, that we come in and we can, we can just come into his presence and he's here and there's a breaking that happens, there's a breakthrough that can happen. There's some agreement, even this morning in, in Dream Team meeting, Pastor Michael made a comment. He said, can we just tell him we need him at the beginning of our day? And it, and it was exactly where I've been this morning. And so sometimes we can go and we can have coworkers or friends and there can be negative agreement where we're coming into agreement with, you know, negative things. But when we come into the house of the Lord, it was good to know that someone else was kind of in the same place, but we found an answer. And the answer is his presence. The answer is to say, I need you. The answer is to praise him for who he is this morning. That breakthrough can come. So Father, this morning, we thank you that the fruit of our lips is praise this morning. God, we determine in our hearts this morning that we will praise you. We will praise you, God, this morning that as we come in, into encountering truth in your word, as we hear the message, as we worship truth, Father, we thank you that our minds are being renewed. Our emotions are being reordered. Father God, our ability to see and perceive our future, wisdom is coming in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that we will end this year well. Father God, we will end this year strong, Father, and we thank you that you are the God of truth. You're the one who anchors us. And so we give praise this morning. Just lift your hands to him. We praise you this morning for you have made us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Father God, we bless you this morning. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just welcome to Epic Church. Greet someone. I know a lot of people are traveling on vacation, but we're glad you're here this morning. of the Lord. Real family is awesome and spiritual family is too. And so I just have a few announcements. On behalf of Pastor Steve and Pastor Shirley Arnold, our senior pastors, I want to welcome you to Epic Church. My name is Pastor Stephanie and I'm over Connections and I'm um, just so happy to be here, be home with the home folks. And we have a few announcements this morning. Just want to get you connected with what's going on between now and the end of the year. Um, we have what's called New Year's Eve Extravaganza and it's, it's awesome for those who've attended in the past. And um, we want you to be a part. We used to have something when I went on missions called a No Talent Talent Show. So if you could have no talent or you could have talent. And so this is really an awesome opportunity for everybody. If you have a, a gift, a talent, or you write poetry, you sing, you dance, or you, you fold origami, whatever. Whatever you want to share with the body as we celebrate the end of the year together, um, you can do that at New Year's Eve Extravaganza. You can sign up online. Um, just click on there and you can put in all your information and it'll be right here starting at 7 o'clock p.m. right here at Epic Church. Um, so that's your first one. Three more to go. Say three more. All right. Be good listeners. The next one's really important. Uh, growth Track is, is what we have here at Epic Church. It meets um, every month, and um, it starts next Sunday at 9 a.m. We have child care, and Growth Track is really where you can say, hey, I, I believe God has sent me to Epic Church. I want to know more about what you believe. How you, what's the process? How do I get involved here? That's what Growth Track is. It's painless, um, and it's a lot of fun. You'll get to meet some of our leaders and get to more, find out more about yourself, and that will be um, next Sunday, January 4th, starting at 9 a.m., right out in the lobby. Okay. All right. Two more. Here we go. Daniel fast begins January 5th. You know, nothing like a good fast to kick off the year. Help, just help your body, mind, and soul. So the Daniel fast books will be available next week. So if you've never Daniel fasted, um, you'll get to, you'll have a booklet that will help guide you through it. And a lot of people here, as you know, as you can hear, um, have done it. So we'll be more than happy to, to co-labor with you as we just help get our body and our mind and our spirits all set in January. And last but not least, the I'm So Epic hoodie t-shirts are available out in the Welcome Center for $35. All right, we're done. Announcements. Praise God. Pastor Ray. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Stephanie. Um, I get the wonderful honor of just speaking to you this morning as before we take up our tithes and offering. Um, and I want to kind of start with the tithe. So Leviticus 27, it begins to outline um, just a lot of things that 
God spoke to the people about being able to tithe back to him from land to homes, etc. And I think the thing that we have to remember um, is that this is a law. This is a command. This isn't an optional thing. So the tithe is not optional. Can we agree on that? Okay, this is important. If you change your mind, you can change your heart. Now consider that as we talk about tithes and we talk about offering. If you change your mind, you can change your heart. You change your mind about a lot of things. You probably changed your mind about what you were wearing in the church this morning. And when you changed your mind, you decided to do something different. So what is the difference? Obedience is better than sacrifice. So what are you sacrificing when you don't obey God's law? To tithe. Abundance, family, provision. The expectation is that these things will continue to flow, but if you are not walking in obedience, how can these things come? So our tithe, we give because God requires it. This is if your boss, you know, when you, you go to your job, your boss, they give you things, resources, so that you can do your job better. And if they come to you and ask for those resources, you don't say to them, well, I don't have that. They gave it to you. They know you have it. And if they're asking for it back, it's not because they want to keep it. It's because they need those resources to give more resources to you. In the same way, like God has already given you, provided for you, has already done that. And so when he comes and he's saying, hey, the tithe is already mine. I'm just asking for what I've already given you. And you say to him, oh, I don't have that. Well, he already knows you have it because he gave it to you. So, so now what you're saying is, I'm willing to lie to God. And then I'm willing to walk in disobedience because I'm not going to give you back what you've already given to me. But then again, again, you ex there's this expectation that abundance is going to flow, provision is going to flow, that these things will come into my life as I walk in disobedience. If you change your mind, you change your heart. Your heart's attitude in regards to tithing can change when your mindset about what takes place in us giving our tithe changes. So this morning as the ushers come forward and we give our tithe, we separate the two here at Epic. And it's been a, a very revelational thing for me, just separating the tithe and the offering, giving space to one, be able to, to admit and to step into agreement with what God has required of me. And then being able to give because I have the opportunity to give back. So we're going to take our tithe this morning. So you, if you want to get that ready, prepare yourselves. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about offering. Because I believe that this is a powerful precept that if we grab a hold of it, if we allow our attitude to shift and to change, that the things that God has already given to us, we will be able to see. Sometimes we can't see because we're blind. To have vision and no vision. To not be able to see what God has given you. And it's right there in front of you. So Father, we bring our tithes into your storehouse this morning. We come into agreement this morning. It's better for us to obey this morning than to sacrifice all the other things that are a part of our lives. And we give back to you what is already yours, gratefully, with joy, knowing that as we give back, you continue to respond and you provide resource into our life. We praise you this morning. We thank you. And we bring our tithes glad. You can go ahead and bring your tithe down.
gifts are offering. Now, this is important. So in Mark 12, 42, Jesus talks about the widow's might. And what happens in this, this transaction is, you know, he's speaking with the disciples and she brings, you know, her might and she places it in there. And Jesus makes the statement that what she gave was greater than everyone else that gave. But the, the words that are used in there, it talks about her giving in her poverty as everyone else gave out of their abundance. Now, the thing that I think is interesting is it didn't say that people decided to not give. That both the widow who was poor and those that had abundance gave. So what, what is happening is all the reasons to not give are being taken off the table because both the widow who was poor in her poverty gave and those that had abundance gave. But then he goes on to say this, that she gave in her poverty. See, we think that you can't give what you don't have, but you can give what you have. Let me repeat that. We say, okay, you can't give what you don't have, but you can give what you have. So again, he's taking the excuses off the table and is saying, here is your opportunity to stay connected to my law, which is if you continue to give, if your hands are open, there is a consistent flow that will stay in your storehouse. The moment you can do this, you no longer have room. There's no opportunity because you have closed and cut off the opportunity for his law to flow through your life. If you change your mind, you change your heart. Change the way that you think about giving, about tithing. The God that is for you, that is giving, is providing is sustaining, that is doing all of those things, is just saying, obedience is what I require of you. As you remain obedient, I will take care of your rest. So this morning, as you bring your offering, may our hearts be in line with the will of the Father. To not only hear, but to do. To act and respond accordingly. Florida. 
It's Christmas. Somebody needs to tell Florida that it's Christmas. It was, I wore shorts yesterday. There's something wrong with that, man. I know it's a sunshine state and all, but just a little bit during Christmas, man. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm Pastor Michael. I'm the Dream Team Coordinator here. And uh, Pastor Steve and Pastor Shirley left out this morning at like 5 a.m. to catch a flight to Texas so that uh, she could be with her mother. Uh, she was going to go on her birthday, but just delays and things like that didn't work out. So uh, she went to go see Bum Bum, as we affectionately call her. Uh, in Texas, so uh, we wish them the best, and they send our love, their love to you all this morning. Um, I wanted to talk about remembering the Christ of Christmas, and maybe we should name it remembering the Christ after Christmas. Has anybody had a little, it was weird Christmas this year, was it weird for anybody? It was weird for me, and it just didn't feel like Christmas. I don't know what it was. It was just weird. It was busy. Maybe the temperature had something to do with it. I just don't know. It just wasn't. It wasn't like Christmas. And so you know, I'm going along, and I, and then the voice of the Lord says, "Well, have you spent time with me since it's my birthday?" Well, okay. I open presents. <laughs> Oh, uh, so I was like, man, so I kind of didn't, you know, I, you know, I prayed every day uh, this week and, you know, read some books and things like that, but I didn't really get in deep in the word like I normally do during the week and every day and things like that. And I was like, well, maybe that's why it wasn't Christmas because I didn't remember the Christ of Christmas, you know, um, <laughs> those first letters there. So I, I thought about, you know, what, it, what does it mean to remember Christ? Because it, it, it really is an everyday thing. Remember Christ. And we, we celebrate, you know, once a year the birth. And, you know, when Easter goes around, we do the death, burial, and resurrection and those kinds of things. And, you know, the two iconic days of the year uh, for us Christians. But then, you know, it really is an everyday thing. Remembering the Christ of Christmas doesn't have to wait till Christmas. And it doesn't have to wait till Easter to remind ourselves who He is what He is, how powerful He is, what He wants to do for us, how He can work in us, through us, around us all the time. And so I thought about the scriptures. It says in John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was a life, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Hallelujah. The darkness didn't comprehend it. Oh my Lord, that means when the enemy comes up and the darkness creeps all about it and the Lord shines his light upon thee, that the darkness don't even know what's going on. It can't even comprehend the brightness of the light. But the word, it says the word was in the beginning. The word became flesh. We know that. So it was Jesus. So the word was in the beginning. That means it was really without beginning. So since our beginning, the word was there. The word took no effort. It said it, and it was done. God didn't say, let there be light, and then went down there and screwed a light bulb up into space somewhere and went, and it boom, and then put a mirror on the other side of the earth to reflect it at night. You know, it says, you know, this is a good place for the moon. We'll just, oh, we, we got to angle it. Okay, there it is. There it is shining now. Okay, no. He spoke it, and it came into being. And it says, Nothing was made that he didn't make. Nothing. Hallelujah. So that means the enemy can only pervert that which has already been created. That's all he can do. He cannot make anything. He cannot create. He, there's nothing that anybody can make except God. And that w was from the very beginning. So at the word of God, he speaks and it is so. Period. Wow, that's pretty powerful. Well, that doesn't do us much good, though, because what do we do with that? 
So it is up to us to come into agreement with that. It is up to us to do something about that, to come into agreement with the Word of God, to find out what the Word of God is, what the Word of God is saying. Because it is alive and well. And what the, while the Scriptures are God-breathed, full of revelation, full of power, every word that was true is true, will always be true. Every word in the scripture is God-breathed, God-inspired. It will do everything that is, every single promise you can claim over your life, and it will happen every day. But there is the revelation power of God. We need to find out what that revelation power is over our life, speaking to us. What is that word that God is speaking over us? What is he saying? What are the promises of God? So that we can remember the Christ of Christmas and we can remember Christ in our everyday life and experience him in our everyday life. We've got to find out what he's saying. What is that word that was in the beginning? What is that word that became flesh? What is that word that is being spoken over me now? That will empower me to do the things that God has called me to do. We must begin to inquire of this Holy Spirit in our life. And say what is this word? What can it do? What will it do? What is it supposed to do? Oftentimes, I feel like when coming down to the altar. You know everything's perfect. You know the, the environment seems right. All of that kind of stuff. I'm reminded of a story that I saw in a movie. Um, it was kind of towards the end. He was telling a joke, and he says, you know, a, a waiter brought soup to the table. And so the, the gentleman being served raised his hand and says, uh, could, you, could you taste the soup? And the guy's like, why? What's wrong with the soup? Well, j just, just taste the soup. He said, what, is it too hot? What, j is it too cold? No, just taste the soup. What, what is there something in it or something? Just taste the the soup. So he looks down and he goes, well, where's the spoon? Aha. <laughs> you figured it out. And that's what I feel like. So oftentimes in my life, I'm, I'm wanting the presence of God. I'm wanting the manifestation. And, the, and the, it's right there and it smells good. And I'd love to participate. And the Holy Spirit's going, just taste it. And I'm like, what's going on, God? Why can't I taste it? What's going on? And it's like, where's the spoon? And the spoon here would be his presence. You know, his manifested presence. Where's, where's my presence? You know, you've got everything set up. You've got your Bible out. You're reading. You're studying. You're doing all the things that you're supposed to do. You're saying all the things that you're supposed to say. You're being all the things that you're supposed to be. You're believing all the things you're supposed to believe. And it smells good. It's a sweet aroma to me. But taste it. Well... I can't because there's no spoon. Right. Oh, man. So how do we get this manifestation of the presence of God in our life? What do we do? How do we remember the Christ of Christmas? How do we empower the word of God that has been spoken over us, that is continually being spoken over us, a fresh and a new saying over us right now, a personal word over our life? What do we do to taste that? We got to get his presence. How do we get his presence? We have to change our posture. My God, it's so hard to change our posture because in the, 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 none of us know what it's like to live with a king or queen. No one knows what it's like to have a majesty that we have to report to and we have to abide by certain protocols to. We don't know what that's like. If the president were to walk in, we'd try to shake his hand, get a picture taken with him, even if we said all kinds of bad things about him. <laughs> we would. We'd be Facebooking that job. We'd be like, selfie. <laughs> Mr. President, smile. <laughs> you wouldn't do that to a king or queen. No. No. Especially way back when, in the great old days, you know, where they spoke broken English and ye and thou and stuff when they spoke King James. <laughs> Man, you wouldn't do that for one second. You wouldn't make eye contact with the king or queen. They'd pull you right out and strap you up right then, right in front of everybody, let you know real quick what you should and should not do in front of a king or queen. And we've been spoiled in this nation because of that. We don't know how to change our posture when we want a king's presence near us. Wow. 
I'm not getting on to it. I don't know either. I don't know what to do. I've never been around royalty ever. I don't know what to do. I'd be like, what's up? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, the president's wife got in trouble because she hugged her, you know. You don't hug the queen. Oh, my God. What do we do when a king comes around? How do we change our posture? What do we do? How do we address that? That's what needs to happen in our lives to bring in the presence of God. We want the presence of God manifested in our life because it's here right now. He is here right now. Amen. Right beside us. There is not a place that I can touch, reach, run, go, blink, breathe that he is not there right now. Right now, just around me. So how do I get that manifestation? I've got to change my posture. I've got to change the posture of my mind. I've got to change the posture of my heart. I've got to change the posture of my attitude. I've got to change the posture because I want the presence of God. I want the good things that he has promised me. I want to participate and partake of everything and every promise that he's ever spoken and the words that he's speaking over me right now. I think about the kings when they were anointed king and, you know, Jesus when he was anointed. You know, David, they pulled him out in the field and he was anointed king. And then, uh, you know, Jesus, he was baptized by John the Baptist. And then, you know, angel of the Lord descended down. This is my son. And he was anointed at that moment. And I think what they did after they were anointed. You know, David slew a giant. Jesus, you know, for three and a half years did more things than any of us have ever done ever in the history of the world has ever done. The central most talked about figure in all of the world. I mean, it's like there's a poem called like One Solitary Life about the whole thing, about how he's still the central figure today and how there is no one been greater ever in the history of the world. And it was only three and a half years. And then, of course, I often throw that mirror up to say, well, what did I do after I got anointed? I used to get upset because when I was taking theology classes, it's pretty thick. It, I don't know if any of you have taken that stuff, but you know, practical theology, I like that one. That was good stuff because that makes sense and it's usable, you know. I ain't got much use for things that things are not usable, you know. And so we'd start getting in that systematic theology. And theology 1 and 2 and really going through. And, you know, I went to Southeastern and they had Dr. Maki there. I don't know if he's still there now. But my God, he knew like five languages. And he would write a language we didn't even know on the board. And so I was like, huh? you know, because I wanted to know God my whole life. I, just, I wanted to pursue God. I mean, I was born on the pew. You know, my mom was a church pianist, and I'd be sitting there underneath the sleep under the pew, you know. And then I finally got a little bit older, and I'd make planes out of gum wrappers and do that there and kind of, you know, battle, you know, kind of stuff. And then I got a little older, I could go to children's church, thank God, you know, and grew up a little bit more <laughs> where I could do it. And, like, I would count. Because there's a gap, a little bit of a gap back in those days where you got out of children's church, but you couldn't do anything else yet. Lord, that was the worst. And so I had it down. Where I, I counted how many prayers there were before there was a dismissal, and it was six prayers. They would pray to open the service. They would pray during offering. They would pray after devotions. They would pray to start the service. They'd pray in the middle of the service. They, and then they'd pray to dismiss it, you know. I'm like, all right. So I'm like, all right, we're at three. We're at three. You know, and I, I keep an ear out for those prayers, you know. I was like, man. But all my life, I mean, if the doors were open, I was at church. All my life, I was in church. I knew what it was to be in church. I knew what it was to proceed. I saw the holy rollers. I saw that. I, I've been to the churches, believe it or not, where they held snakes and stuff like that. That's not for me. And if that's for you, God bless you. 
And uh, it, just not for me. And uh, so, I, I mean, I've been there, seen it, you know, that craziness. <laughs> not craziness, but to me it was craziness at that age, viewing that kind of stuff. And, I mean, I would just see people. I would see people get up on the little pews at the altar area, and they would get up and, like, walk across it like a tightrope or something. I mean, and people that were had no balance or coordination of any kind would walk across it without falling. Just, but I've seen people just run around the building, man, just take off. I'm like, hallelujah. And it was always the person that had the biggest set of keys. And you could hear it like, shee, 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 like sleigh bells or something. But my whole life, I just pursued the presence of God. I wanted, I wanted to know what it was so much so that I said, okay, well, I got to get a degree in theology. I got to find out who God is, what God is, what he's doing. What is the definition of God? How is that active in my life? And maybe by defining who God is and what he is and what he looked like and how he was formed and all of those kinds of things and understanding all of that stuff and maybe even picking up a language or two that they would write on the board that I didn't understand at the time. And maybe they would write that up on the board. And maybe then, I would understand what it would take to get the presence of God to be active. And now I realize it's about changing the posture. I could have gotten so much more out of my theology class had I changed my posture before I went in and allowed the presence of God to be with me. This book would have not been so hard to read as a young kid, had I remembered or even realized that all I had to do was change my posture before I opened this book and make sure that the manifested presence of God was there before I started reading. Man, I would choke it down. I mean, it was like taking something that you don't like, you know, and have it shoved down your throat, knowing that you have to eat it, knowing that you have to get it down. You know, like Popeye with spinach. It's like, it, it made him stronger. But boy, he was like, and he had to get it down. But that's what it was like going to those theology classes, just sitting there going, oh, God, I don't think I could take one more thing in this class and, and they would give you a test on this stuff and I would just pray my way through this test because I, I, it was like sp reading a different language and I was like I don't know what this says <laughs> but if I would have just changed my posture and invited the presence of God to the room around me and said God can you manifest your presence here if I would have brought the spoon so that I could eat the soup so many times in our life, we try to undertake these things and these feats. We try to explain God rather than adore Him. We try to scientifically approach Him through classes or whatnot. And again, they're not wrong, but they just lack the presence. And we try to formulize God Instead of worshiping God. Because by worshiping God, we can experience God. By worshiping God, I could have experienced Him through my theology class. Even though it was hard, and even though it was difficult, and even though I st really just walked out of there at, at the end of it all, knowing that His ways are higher than my ways. And his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And I probably just won't understand the mysteries of God. But I can worship him. I can change my mind and focus solely on him. I can stop digging around and trying to this plus this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this equals God. If I read my scriptures, if I say this many prayers, if I spend this many hours with God or talking to God or dedicate this time or sacrifice, you know, this or make sure my tithes and offerings are paid and all that's done and I've given them like I should have been doing and I'm walking in everything that I understand to do, but I forgot to change my posture and invite the presence of God. It's nothing because nothing was made that was made without him. The scriptures are very clear that nothing was made that was made without him. Period. So I can't get nothing.
without him. I can't understand anything without him. I can't get the word and the empowerment of God over my life without him. Period. So I think about, okay, so what's the posture that we need to take? How do we do that? What is that like? I mean, in the old days, they would just bow. The king was coming. They'd have this entourage before and after the king. They wouldn't even make eye contact. They would just sit here like this and let the king pass by. And when they would come into the king's chambers, they would bow until addressed by the king. And they would just sit and wait for the king to acknowledge them, wait for the court to call them up, and stand before the king, and they would just sit there. There's something about just sitting there, isn't there? That makes you realize the gravity of the moment, the seriousness of what is happening right now, that the king who determines the fate of that population or community is now walking by. The person who makes the decisions that when they say it, it will be so. How much more do we need to change our posture to make it inviting to the king? The president went to Disney World one time, and uh, not our current president. I don't know. Maybe he did. I don't know. But anyway, a president, one of the presidents went to Disney World, and they sent a group of people of different uh, industries. So you had welders, you had technical people, you had secret service, you had security, things like that. Went weeks ahead of time and went through the entire facility, evaluated all the weaknesses. They tap welded all the manhole covers, all of that stuff to make it ready for the president. Have we made our temple ready for the king? Again, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to give you revelation on how to have the manifested presence of God in your life. That is what I truly desire. That is what I truly think that you desire at your deepest, deepest place in your heart that you desire the presence of God more than you desire anything else. You want to know. I always wanted to know. What is it that I need to do? What is it that I need to say? It's great that you read the scriptures to me. And it's great that you tell me that I need the manifested presence of God in my life. But if you don't tell me how to get it in my life, you need to shut up and sit down. You know, that's how I feel about it. It's like, come on, somebody tell me how to get the manifested presence of God in my life. Tell me what it is. No matter how bad it seems or no matter how hard it is, or whatever hoops that I ever it is that I have to jump through or whatever it is that I, whatever junk I've got to get out of my heart. I want the revelation of how to have the manifested presence of God in my everyday life because that is what will change my situations and circumstances. That will pull me out of the deepest, darkest places of hell. That will move me into the light that bewilders the darkness that it can't even understand it. And what it can't understand, they're not going to go near it pulls me into a place that darkness cannot touch me. That is what I believe that we all desire. And we have to change our posture. David said it best in Psalm 46, 1 through 11. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Let's go on down a little bit. Um, uh, the Lord of hosts, verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come and behold, come behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in fire. Now verse 10 is how we change our posture. Be still and know that I am God because... I will be exalted. Say, I will be. I will be exalted among nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Think about it. That's what Selah means. Think about it. 
Be still and know. How many times are we pulling out and working and doing all of these things and spinning around in circles, expecting a different result, expecting the presence of God to manifest herself, and all he is saying is, I just need you to be still and know that I am. Oh my God, how liberating that is to just know that all I have to do is change my posture so that the king can come by. All I have to do is be still and then I'll know. It's very clear when you take this posture because everybody's quiet and everybody's taking the same posture, it's very obvious to know when the king is coming by. There is no doubt. But I'm too busy buying presents. I'm too busy putting up trees. I'm too busy hanging lights. I'm too busy running here and there, doing this and that. Being all of these things, doing all of that stuff that I don't even see the king is making his way and processing down because I'm so busy. Not that any of those things are wrong. They're only wrong if they keep you from being still and knowing. Because we need to be still and know that he is God. Be still and know that he is God. If we become more inviting of the king. And we are taking the correct posture. Then everything changes. He comes into our work. He comes into our homes. He comes into our devotions. He comes with us in our car, cars. He comes with us everywhere we are all the time because we're taking the correct posture all the time. We're acknowledging the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's the moment that everything begins to change. That's the moment. I think about Peter when he went to Cornelius' house. Um, and right before he did, he had the dream. And the dream, there was like a, a blanket that came down and all the foods that the uh, Jewish people were not allowed to eat. All the things. All the things that in, in the Exodus and Leviticus and that they all spoke about, all the things that they were not allowed to eat were basically on that blanket. And Peter was like, nope, not eating any of that. And the Lord said to him, how dare you not eat? And how dare you call unclean what I have called clean? The difference is the presence. That's what makes unclean clean. That's what makes darkness light. That's what changes the difference between healed and not. That is the only difference because he is the only one that can take ashes and make beauty out of it. He's the only one that can turn anything around. He is because nothing was made that was made unless it was him. Nothing. The difference is presence. He can call the cursed thing not cursed. He can call the unclean thing clean. He is the one that can do that. We have nothing but to come into agreement with the very word of God that is spoken over us every day. We get in tune with the manifested presence of God. We find out what that word is and we come into agreement with it and we take the posture to be still and know that he is God and he is the one speaking over our life and he is the one declaring over our life and then when he manifests his presence we can move Move in the promises that he has given us and move into that place that we've always wanted to be our whole life, which is the manifested presence of God. That is what gives us power. That is what releases us into the place that we have to go and into the purpose that God has called us to be and do. It is the presence of God that changes us. It's the presence of God that moves us. The presence of God makes us clean. The presence of God puts us into light and bewilders the darkness. 
It is the presence of God. Hallelujah. So how do we address this presence of God? Isaiah said it best. Boy, thank God for those seeing prophets. Say we still need the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6, we'll start there. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of, pre, uh, Prince, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Hallelujah. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. In case we didn't understand what from that time forward means. We just went and said, oh, and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will, will perform this. Oh my Lord. Not even the Lord himself, but his zeal will do it. His zeal will be sure to carry out the promises of God. So in the culture of the kings and queens of the earth, they would say they would address them as your majesty, your highness, uh, king, queen. How are we to address the king if we are to change our posture? Wonderful. So when we're being still and knowing, there's only going to be one that answers to this call. This isn't going to be your highness and a bunch of people turn around. This isn't going to be uh, your majesty and, a, and, and, and the king or queen turns around. You're going to sit down, bow low, change your posture in the presence of the Almighty God to bring His pre manifested presence before you begin to get that revelation, before you begin to take devotions, before you do whatever it is that you're about to do. You're going to take that posture and you're going to call out, Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. And if it's not there and it's not clear, get a little bit louder. You know, because sometimes your flesh don't hear so well. All right? And it's the flesh that has to get into line. It's the flesh that has to understand and get out of the way. Has to get out of the way, so we, we've got to, we got to get in the presence of God. I just got to get in the presence of God, and we have to tell our flesh over and over again. And we, sometimes we just have to get a little bit louder so that our flesh understands that we're not going to quit until the manifested presence of God comes upon us. And so I'm going to say it over and over again. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. And I'm going to declare it over and over again until the manifested presence of God comes because I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to shut down because it is the only thing that can make things new. It is the only thing that can make the darkness light. It is the only thing that can make what was unclean clean. It is the only thing. There is no words that I can say. There is no things that I can do. There isn't anything that I can read or study or be. The only difference is if the king is here. The only difference is if the king is here. Is the king here? I have to change my posture if he's not. My work is different because now I understand that I have to acknowledge the king before I start working. And I have to be willing and using the human fleshly term to be inconvenienced by his presence if he shows up. I don't know when the king was coming. 
people may not have known when King David was about to walk out in the street. But when he did, they stopped what they were doing. And God still knew that the king was there. And so sometimes in the middle of me sweeping or in the middle of me doing what God has me to do and what he's called me to do, he might show up. And the next question is, what are you going to do? Are you going to be ashamed and not do anything? Or are you going to change your posture immediately? When the presence of the king shows up. Man, I tell you, I don't want, I don't care. I, I, I sat and think about because sometimes I find my way on TV by accident. I don't, you know, I remember one time. Uh, Channel 55 was having uh, their, uh, whatever it is, the, the a-thon that they have, share a or give a or whatever it is that raises fun, money, funds for the channel. And so Pastor Shirley was asked to go and do like one of the hour segments or whatever. So I'm, I'm in there and I'm just sitting because I'm, I'm along for the ride. I love production stuff. That's what I do. I build studios and install stuff like that. So I love it. So I'm sitting back there. And Claude Bauer's daughter comes over and said, now, you brought your piano player with you, didn't you? Pastor Shirley said, yeah, right here. <laughs> now, she is an accomplished pianist. Now, I'm telling you, she like had like super form. I'm like a worship pianist. There's like a little difference, you know, as far as, you know, setting up on stage and playing for cameras and things like that. You know, I get up here and we can have the presence of God and we can all worship together. And I, I you know, I can tickle the ivories that way. But now she can play, play. And she's like, yeah, just she waves me over. God almighty. Those positions I find myself in. So I'm like, okay, sure. I go over and start playing the piano for that whole hour. You know, just playing in the background. And I, I sit there and think, if I were ever faced with that situation and the king chose to show himself, would I be ashamed to do that on live TV? You know? I just don't want to deny him. Because I want it so bad that I think I'd be willing to look like a fool to anybody else just so that I could make sure that I properly address the king. Because that's what matters. And at the end of the day, it's the only thing that matters. I really just come down to it. They can just call me crazy. I, by us declaring that word of God, though, it opens up the world around us. It opens up the atmosphere around us. It makes it fruitful for miracle signs and wonders. You know, I always thought it was funny. You know, John G. Lake, before he was even the healer guy that we all know, the most, one of the most noted healers of all time. You know, Dowie, he sent a letter to Dowie because his wife was dying. And Dowie had this little thing. He would read the letters of the people that came in. And he had this little thing. And it had a stamp on it. And it would say, uh, you were prayed for on this date. And it had the date on it. So he would hold it up. And he prayed for him. And he would hit that thing. And it would stamp the date on it. Because he was coming to agreement with the very word of God. And he wanted you to know when that word was made manifest. Man, we need to get that back in our lives. We need to know and breathe the very word of God or shut up. You know, forgive me for being so blunt, but it's like either speak the words of God or shut up because nothing else is going to happen otherwise. Nothing that was made was made without him. Nothing that was made. I can't make anything. I'm going to decide the words at that point. You know? King Solomon knew the importance of the presence of God. He built a whole new temple of it. And it, it just sat there. It was so beautiful. I've been to the Taj Mahal. Has anybody been to the Taj Mahal before? Man, it's beautiful. You know, I go into that place, but there's no presence. I think about the temple, King Solomon's temple, when he built that, how beautiful it was. But it was nothing without the presence of God. And man, they made... Extra sacrifices that day. They made extra special care for that day. And sure enough, as a result of their efforts and as a result of their worship, 
the Spirit showed up, so much so that no one could carry there on their duties. They all fell out. Every single person fell out because the presence of God showed up. But the good news is, ladies and gentlemen, is that does not where it starts. When they got back up, the priests priested better. The ushers ushered better. The musicians played better. It's better because the presence of God is there. The manifested presence of God, because His presence is here right now, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. It's around us all the time when we do right or we do wrong. It's there all the time. But the manifested presence of God, when it shows up, we might have to be still and know for a minute. And we might have to say, Mighty Counselor, Wonderful, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And we might have to take a minute to let the King, and we may be not functional for just a little bit, but after the King passes and He has manifested His presence and He has shown up and show out in our midst, then we can get up and do what we did better. We can accomplish more. We can do things that we never thought we were able to do before because the King has made his presence known because we have taken the time to know him. Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet this morning? We've got to be still and know. We've got to change the posture of our hearts, our minds, our attitudes. We have to change because I, I can sense the desire of the body of Christ that it has to shift. We, it has to change. We've come off all of our mountains and we've left it and let the enemy go up in all those places that we used to be and we're no longer there anymore. Christians are no longer in the places and pillars of society where we should be and where we're supposed to be anymore. And now as we're fighting back, we try, choose to climb these mountains and climb these pillars to take our rightful positions but we're doing it without presence we're doing it without the posture we're doing it without the processional of the king we're trying to take the ark of the covenant back by man's way instead of God's way David learned that real quick and so the next time around he took it every seven step he made a sacrifice he knew how to bring it in the second time he wasn't going to mess that up and the world has to shift it's in trouble and the body of Christ is the answer. We have to be ready because we know how to posture ourselves before royalty. We need to know the voice, hear the promise, declare them, believe them, move in faith of that that we believe and hope. The word will be made alive and not return void. You will live, you will declare, you will win, you will have victory. Write the word, record the word, exercise the word, and hear the word of the Lord. We must do this daily daily every day before our day begins and I would say before our day ends we should do this daily we should know how to be still and know we should know how to posture ourselves before the king of kings and the lord of lords so that when the king comes by we know it's him right now I think we're a little confused sometimes we don't know if it maybe it is maybe it's not but when we're still and we call out what his name should be, which is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. He'll show up and we'll know. Right, right then we'll know. It'll become very clear. And as the king passes us by, we will become empowered like we've never been able, been empowered before in our entire life. His presence will be manifest in our life. And we'll be able to partake of the good things of God. And that is what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. It is not about con condemnation. It is about revelation of who God is and what causes the manifestation, the posture that invites the manifested presence of God.
Hallelujah. Bow, bow your heads with me this morning. Father, right now, I ask that we would become partakers of the manifested presence of God. Father, that we would change our posture, that we would change our hearts and minds, Lord. That we, you would move us into a place that we can be still and know that you are God. That we would not read another scripture unless we've invited your presence there to make it alive. Because other than that, they're just words. They don't mean anything. They won't do anything. But your presence will make the difference as we read your word. Your presence will make the difference as we pray. Other than that, it's just words that we say that come out of our mouth and they, they hit heavens of brass. They don't even make it anywhere. But Father, when we invite your presence and we are still first and we invite the presence and our posture is inviting of you, our words will mean something. Your words and your scriptures will mean something. The studies and the work that we do, the volunteer things that we do, the servanthood things that we do will begin to mean something because we've changed our posture to invite the King, oh God. Father, let us have the full revelation of your manifested presence in your life. No longer would we be like deists who believe that you created the world but then left it to that you won't interfere with anything anymore. Father, let us no longer be content that the manifested presence is not in our life. We've been content without your presence for far too long, God. Let us today choose the manifested presence of God in our daily life and no longer be satisfied unless you are present. Revealing yourself, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So we make these altars open at this time. If anything is I've said to you or the Spirit has said to you has, has triggered your heartstrings and you want to come down with prayer of agreement or you, you need the manifested presence in your life and you just want some prayer for that. If there's anything else, if you need healing, you need deliverance, you want to pray for a family member, you need uh, prayer, uh, financial breakthroughs in your life, you need breakthrough in your life, the altars are open. We're available to pray for you at any time if you would come down. For the rest of you, go out and change somebody's life this week. God bless you guys. Love you. Amen. All right. And New Year's Eve extravaganza starts this Wednesday at 7. 7 to 10. Special guest. Make sure you sign up. God bless you guys.